So let's take just a minute to summarize what we've learned from working these examples. If you had been paying attention on example 2 and 3, what you would have realized that is, was that when we computed x of z, we got the exact same value for x of z in both example 2 and example 3. We had x of z was equal to z over z minus alpha in both of those problems. The only difference between these problems was the region of convergence. In example 2, we got a region of convergence that included all points in the complex plane outside of a circle, while in example 3, we got a region of convergence that contained all the points in the complex plane inside of a circle. So really the only difference between examples 2 and 3 was the fact that their region of convergence was different. And that's interesting. And what we from that, what we can uh, see is that in general, when you talk about the Z transform, unless you tell me the region of convergence, I don't know what type of discrete time signal you're working with. It could be a signal that goes off to the right or a signal that goes off to the left. You have to tell me not just the Z transform, but also the region of convergence for me to uniquely know what discrete time signal you were working with. So let's just talk about that phenomenon here just a little bit by summarizing what we found in each of these different examples. In example one, we worked with a discrete time signal that had a finite number of non-zero points. And we computed the Z-transform, and we found the Z-transform was this. And we talked about the region of convergence, and we determined that the region of convergence was everywhere on the Z-plane, except the points Z equals plus minus infinity, because if z is negative infinity or positive infinity, this point right here blows up, and that's a pole of x of z. Or the point z equals 0. When z equals 0, this is 1 over z. So that would be 1 over 0, which is infinity. So the point z equals 0 is also a pole of x of z. So these were the only points we had to worry about. Otherwise, the region of convergence was the entire complex plane. In example 2, we worked with a discrete time signal x of k equals alpha to the k u of k and we found that its z transform was equal to z over z minus alpha and it had a region of convergence equal to the magnitude of z greater than alpha and we sketch what this looked like and this looked like the set of points in the complex plane outside the circle of radius alpha so this is what its region of convergence looked like and then finally, in example 3, we worked with the discrete time signal minus alpha to the k, u of minus k minus 1, and we computed the z transform. In terms of x of z, we got the exact same answer here. So both of these were perfectly identical. The difference was the region of convergence. Here, the region of convergence was the set of points magnitude z less than magnitude alpha. So if we sketch that in the complex plane, we got this set of points. In general, this phenomena is consistent. Anytime we deal with a finite length signal, the only points that we'll have to worry about are the points z equals plus and minus infinity or z equals zero. Those are the only points we'll have to worry about anytime we deal with a finite length signal. When we deal with what we call a right-sided signal, and this is an example of a right-sided signal, this is a signal that exists for positive time, it goes to the right, Anytime we deal with a right-sided signal, the region of convergence is always going to be points outside of some circle, of some radius. So this is a right-sided signal, and region of convergences for right-sided signals always look like this, a set of points outside of a circle. And then finally, this is what we call a left-sided signal. This is a signal that exists for negative time. It exists towards the left on the time axis. And any time we deal with a left-sided signal, the region of convergence is inside of a circle. So this right here, this region of convergence, this is what it will always look like for a left-sided signal. So these are just good things to know about regions of convergence. And depending on what type of signal you're dealing with, right away you'll know what the region of convergence should end up looking like. You won't know exactly what the radius of the circle is off the map, possibly, but you will know that when working with right-sided signals, it will always be outside of a circle. When working with left-sided signals, it's always going to be inside of a circle, etc. So in the next charts, or next videos, we'll actually mathematically derive why this is true. This is kind of proof by example, which isn't really a proof, but we'll actually work through the math showing why this is true, 
and then we'll also turn our attention to a signal type that we haven't dealt with yet, namely a double-sided signal. What about signals that go infinitely to the left and infinitely to the right? We haven't talked about that yet. We've done one case, signals that exist to the right, and we've done this other case, signals that exist to the left, but we haven't tried to find a Z-transform of a signal that has non-zero samples infinitely to the left and to the right. That's something else we still need to tackle.